Hi everyone and welcome back to Neuropsychology. So in the last video we talked a little bit more about the occipital lobe so we mainly talked about the two connectivity streams. So we talked about the dorsal stream and about the ventral stream um, and how the dorsal stream consists of the area that goes from the occipital lobe to the parietal lobe and how the ventral stream consists of this STS stream and also the IT stream are also called the ventral stream but these two together will make the ventral stream. And lastly we talked about the fusiform face area. So in this video we're going to talk about five categories of visual processing. So um, these five are vision for action, action for vision, visual recognition, visual space, and visual attention. So we're going to talk about those uh, one by one. So more of the cortex than just our V1 through V5 is devoted to vision um, compared to any other function in our brain, so mainly in the primate brain. So visual processing, especially in humans, continues within multiple visual regions in the parietal, temporal, and frontal cortices. So technically, a lot of these brain regions are working together for these um, to process visual stimuli. Functions have not been assigned to all brain regions, but evidence shows that different regions have very specific functions. Like just similarly as um, the fusiform area, or the, sorry, the fusiform face area, and how um, that area is really important for recognizing faces. So vision is composed of many highly specific forms of processing. And these forms of processing can be technically characterized in five big categories. So we have vision for action, action for vision, visual recognition, visual space, and visual attention. Okay, so let's go through these one at a time. Okay, so let's start off with the first one, which is vision for action. And this category um, is the visual processing that is required for um, a specific movement. So, for example, when you're reaching for a coffee cup, like in this image, the fingers will form a specific pattern that will enable you to grasp this cup. So this movement is obviously guided by vision, because people don't regularly put their hands in that shape, right? So another example would be, for example, um, wanting to kick a soccer ball. So you have to see where this soccer ball is located um, and then direct your leg towards it so you can kick it. So you need this visual processing so you can do this direct specific movement. So in addition to just grasping or kicking, various visual areas guide all kinds of specific movements, including the eyes, the head, and the rest of our whole body. So a single system could not easily guide all these movements together, because of course your whole body is working together. Um, and all of these little movements together are very different and very specific. So reaching and picking up something small, like a pencil, requires very different instructions compared to whenever you're ducking for a snowball or something, if your sister or brother is throwing one at you at your ski vacation. Um, but what these two movements have in common is that both of these movements are visually guided. So if you want to pick up a pencil or duck for a snowball, you are first seeing and then doing. So it's vision for action. Vision for action is also sensitive to the movement of a target. So whenever you're, for example, trying to catch a ball that is, movi uh, that is moving, it also requires specific information about the location, the speed, shape of that ball, etc. So for example, if it's a basketball or a really big ball, uh, you would maybe want to catch it with two hands, whereas a smaller ball, you'd want to catch it with one hand, like a tennis ball. 
So vision for action is a function of the parietal visual areas in your dorsal stream. So definitely remember that one. So this is part of your dorsal stream. Okay, moving on to the next one. So the next one is action for vision. So don't uh, confuse vision for action with action for vision. I know they sound very similar, um, but they're very different. So it's technically kind of the opposite. So action for vision is more of a top-down process where the viewer actively searches for um, parts of the targets, objects, and to be able to attend to it selectively. So for example, whenever we look at a visual stimulus, we do not just simply stare at it, even though we think we do, we don't. We scan the stimulus with a lot of tiny little eye movements. So we focus on little subparts of a stimulus. So it's kind of like scanning a barcode. So these movements are most definitely not random. Um, but they do tend to focus on important and distinct features of the stimulus. So let's talk, for example, um, about a face. So whenever we see someone, um, when we scan a face with our eyes um, with, and the rest of, the, of our visual system, of course, we make multiple eye movement di directed towards the eyes of the face and the mouth of the face. So the first thing we focus on is the eyes and the mouth. And what's funny is that we also direct more eye scans to the left visual field, aka to someone's, um, the right side of their face, which is, has been shown according to prior research. So we definitely focus more on the right side of the face um, of someone else than on their left side of their face. So this scanning bias may be very important in the way we process faces because we do, we do not have this scanning bias with other objects. So an interesting as, um, aspect of action for vision is the eye movements we often make when we visualize information. So for example, when people are asked to rotate objects mentally um, to answer simple questions about those objects or their appearance, they usually make eye movements um, especially to the left. So they also have this like left bias. When people are acting in the dark, however, so for example, if you're in your kitchen and you're trying to find this water bottle that you left on the counter, these movements stop. So you do not scan. And sometimes we still try to scan, um, but our visual system may actually interfere with this. So often it's actually easier to walk in the dark in an area you know with your eyes closed because we um, act more by touch so we more often touch counters and try to feel where an object is so here on the right of the screen um, you see the eye movement so here the eye movements were tracked whenever someone was looking at a face so they were all shown pictures of faces and you can see where the eyes were looking at more. So this eye tracking happened more to the left side, so to the right side of this person's face, like right here. And that happened to many, many other pictures and many other faces. Um, okay, so someone's eye movements also concentrate um, on the shape of something or the outline of something. So, for example, here, um, someone would try to find an outline or if, if someone's looking at a head and like the shoulders, it's kind of like an outline of our shoulders and the head. It's obviously very rough, but it's just how our eyes would scan it. It would go to the outline and to the outline of our, of our um, shoulders. However, if someone has agnosia, so a person who has agnosia, um, which technically means the inability to interpret sensations, um, which will not en enable you to recognize something, those people will scan objects with their eyes very differently. And instead of having the specific pattern of how our eyes scan items, these uh, scans or the scanning of these objects will be actually very random. So you can see that right here. So 
this is a person with agnosia and this person is scanning the exact same items as this person is. However, you can see that this is super random and here also super random. So um, key point is whenever someone has um, agnosia, they do not have this specific scanning of her eyes, which falls under action for vision. Okay, so the third one, category three is visual recognition. So the term technically already says it, visual recognition is basically how we recognize objects. We normally like the ability to recognize objects and to be able to respond to visual information. So for example, we can recognize faces, but we can also recognize subsets of those faces, like for example, facial expression. Similarly, we can also recognize letters and then we can give meaning to them by putting to them together when we read a word, for example. So we have specialized areas in the temporal lobe for biologically significant information, such as faces and hands, but also for objects and places. Okay, the fourth category is visual space. And again, this term also kind of already infers um, what it means. So visual information that comes from specific locations in space allows us to direct our movements to objects in that space and to assign meaning to those objects. Objects have information about location, both relative to yourself, so to the individual, um, and we call this egocentric space. So, for example, if you're looking how far um, your bed is from you right now, that is the egocentric distance from the bed to you. However, we also store information about objects relative to one another, and this is called allocentric space. Egocentric visual space is central to controlling your actions towards an object. So, it is therefore... Um, it therefore seems likely that visual space is coded in neural systems that are related to the first category we talked about. So that's vision for action. And in contrast, allocentric space information of objects are important for you to create a memory of spatial location. So a key feature of allocentric spatial coding is its dependence on the identity of particular objects. So therefore, um, it is associated with regions that also code for um, another category we just talked about, the previous one, which is visual recognition. So basically, different aspects of spatial processing probably occur in both the parietal and temporal visual regions, and respective functions are integrated in areas that interact and exchange information. So often, these categories can kind of work together. Okay, and last but not least, the last category is visual attention, and the words already stated. So we have all this input into our eyes, all these light waves from our entire visual field. However, we cannot possibly process all the available visual information because our brain would go very crazy. So for example, um, as you're looking at your um, computer screen, it has a specific shape, a specific color, um, there's a background, probably like the wall of your, um, of your room, and the size of your computer have characteristics and buttons and stuff. However, what you pay attention to is most likely this image of the bunny and the words on the screen. So your brain selects specific aspects of this visual input and attends to it selectively. So neurons in the, uh, in the cortex have various attentional mechanisms. Neurons may respond selectively to stimuli in particular places or at particular times. Independent mechanisms of attentions are probably required for both guiding movements, so um, guiding movements relies mainly on the parietal lobe and also for recognizing objects with which relies on the temporal lobe. Okay, so that was the end of this video and I will see you guys back soon for the next video.